Welcome to When X Ruled the Multiplex, in which I analyze the films that were in some way important to many of us who came of age in the 1980s. I've already looked at the influence John Hughes had over many US Gen Xers in their teens or preteens with Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club, both of which Hughes wrote and directed. Almost as influential was 1986's Pretty in Pink, which Hughes wrote but did not direct. A music video director named Howard Deutsch was chosen for that task. Deutsch would go on to direct another film based on one of Hughes's scripts, 1987's Some Kind of Wonderful, which starred Leah Thompson, who we have seen in Howard the Duck and Back to the Future. Thompson and Deutsch would marry in 1989. Their daughter is actress Zoe Deutsch, which doesn't make me feel old at all. Pretty in Pink is known for its outstanding soundtrack, which boasts cuts from new wave artists like New Order and The Smiths and orchestral maneuvers in the dark. The first spark of an idea for this film came from the 1977 song Pretty in Pink by the English new wave group The Psychedelic Furs, which is a sympathetic and bittersweet look at a girl who is never taken seriously by her lovers. Hughes's script ended up being about a girl who wants to be taken seriously, even though various people in her life consider her disposable because she's poor. That psychedelic first song plays over the opening credits, which features establishing shots of our protagonist's neighborhood in a somewhat shabby and neglected area of a Chicago suburb. A teenager named Andy Walsh gets ready for school, dressing in an eclectic assortment of handmade clothing in the modest home she shares with her father Jack. Jack is unemployed, and it falls to Andy to get him out of bed and get him ready for a job interview. Andy is played by Sixteen Candles and Breakfast Club star Molly Ringwald in her third and final starring role in a Hughes film. Her father, Jack, is played by legendary character actor Harry Dean Stanton. Andy's mother recently abandoned her family, and Andy and Jack, who have a close bond, have not yet recovered from the shock. Jack admires Andy's outfit, which, as an aspiring designer, she made herself. She notes that she spent $15 on her shoes at a secondhand store. The Walshes are poor, and the film clearly wants us to think this means Andy is frugal. But $15 is actually a crazy amount of money to spend on secondhand shoes in 1986. It is a very Hollywood idea of what a poor girl would spend on shoes. Unless this was a wild splurge for Andy, who is the family's sole breadwinner, working part-time at a record store after school at a time when the federal minimum wage was a hair over $3 an hour, she would not have spent that much on shoes, and if she had, she would not have presented it to her dad as a thrifty purchase. Andy arrives at school, where she meets her best friend Ducky Dale, played by John Cryer in his breakout role. In the late 90s, I worked on a television show that would frequently feature celebrity guests, and John Cryer was always, always one of our favorites. He was smart and funny, and he was nice to everyone. His first time guest hosting, he showed up an hour early and just hung out at my cubicle. Thumbs up for John Cryer. Ducky is offbeat and eccentric, and like Andy, he dresses in an eccentric manner. Their high school is upper middle class, and their fellow classmates dress in standard mid-80s preppy fashions, and Andy and Ducky clearly stand out. Ducky is head over heels in love with Andy, and he takes every possible opportunity to let her know this, stopping just a hair short of outright harassment. In class, Andy is taunted by a pair of mean classmates. Kate, played by Emily Longstreth, and Benny, played by Kate Vernon. Kate Vernon is one of those actresses I always enjoy because she tends to play gloriously mean floozies. You might remember her as horrible drunken Ellen Ty in the Battlestar Galactica reboot. Andy's well-intentioned teacher, who is played by Margaret Colin, who would go on to play Blair Waldorf's mother on Gossip Girl, realizes Andy is being bullied. She chastises Kate and Benny in front of the whole class, which of course only makes things more awkward for Andy. After school, Andy is harassed and insulted by a wealthy, arrogant, and horny classmate named Steph, played by James Spader, whom we have seen in Less Than Zero and in the greatest trash classic of the 80s, Tough Turf. Steph is the role that established Spader as one of the most delightfully loathsome villains in teen-geared cinema. After Pretty in Pink, whenever Spader popped up in an 80s film, you could just sit back and know you were in for some marvelously despicable behavior. Andy mans the register at a retail job at a record store, which is managed by punk goddess Iona. Iona is played by Annie Potts, then riding high on her high-profile supporting role as Janine in Ghostbusters. There's a quick scene where Iona attacks a young shoplifter with a staple gun. The shoplifter is played by Christian Jacobs, who'd go on to become the lead singer of the Aquabats and the creator of Nickelodeon's Yo Gabba Gabba. A wealthy classmate named Blaine, who happens to be Steph's best friend, enters the store, and he and Andy set about making furtive but meaningful eye contact with each other. Blaine is played by Andrew McCarthy, whom we've seen in St. Elmo's Fire and Less Than Zero. Andy goes to a club where the band Talkback performs the song Rudy on stage. Andy hangs out with her friend Jenna and Jenna's boyfriend Simon. Simon is played by musician Dweezil Zappa, who is the son of legendary singer-songwriter Frank Zappa, 
and who was dating Molly Ringwald during filming. Jenna is played by Alexa Kennan, who died before Pretty in Pink made it into theaters. At the request of her parents, the cause of her death has never been publicly released. Still thinking of Blaine, Andy casually raises the idea of dating a rich guy, which utterly appalls Jenna. Meanwhile, outside the club, Ducky can't get past the bouncer, who is played by stand-up comedian Andrew Dice Clay. Andy gives Ducky a ride home, and they drive through an expensive neighborhood so Andy can stare longingly at all the fancy houses. In the school library, Blaine somehow gains control over Andy's computer to send her messages from across the room, which is a really cool trick in 1986. A surprising knack for computers is far and away the most interesting character trait Blaine will display in the entire film. Andy is smitten, and it's clear Blaine feels the same. Later, Blaine drops by the record store to flirt with Andy. They're interrupted by Ducky, who accidentally sets off the burglar alarm. A frazzled Andy deals with the alarm, and by the time she returns, she discovers Blaine has left with Steph. At lunch, Blaine ventures out to the back of the school where all the tough kids hang out and smoke. If you grew up in the 80s, raise your hand if your high school had a school-sanctioned smoking section for the kids. Mine did, which kind of blows my mind now. Blaine approaches Andy and asks her out on a date. In a fit of insecurity about the prospect of Blaine seeing her shabby house in her shabby neighborhood, Andy asks him to pick her up at the record store. Steph spots Blaine chatting with Andy, so he seizes the opportunity to be awful. He gleefully trash talks Andy to Blaine. In PE class, Jenna and Andy run afoul of mean girl Benny, who is joined by a fellow mean girl played by future showgirl star Gina Gershon. Andy and Jenna get kicked out of the gym by the PE teacher, who is played by Maggie Roswell, the voice of Helen Lovejoy on The Simpsons. At the record store, Andy impatiently waits for Blaine to arrive. Ducky shows up and does a dramatic lip sync to Otis Redding's Try a Little Tenderness, only to have his heart crush when he realizes Andy and Blaine are going on a date. Ducky melts down at the prospect of Andy dating someone who is A, rich, B, popular, and C, not Ducky. He explodes into a full-on tantrum. Blaine takes Andy to a party at Steph's mansion, which is filled with people who absolutely despise her and are openly horrible to her. They try to hide in a bedroom to get away from all the jerks, but they run into Steph and Benny, who are hilariously loathsome to them. Worst date ever. For revenge, Andy takes Blaine to her favorite club, where the Rave Ups are playing Rave Up Shut Up. Remember back in Sixteen Candles when Molly Ringwald's character had the Rave Up scribbled on her binder because Molly's sister was dating the lead singer? This seems like the next logical progression. Ducky is at the club with Iona, who has taken him out drinking out of a sense of pity. Ducky, who is behaving like a petulant child, is hostile towards them and calls Blaine a buttwad, among other insults. The date is a mess, but Blaine insists he had a great time. He asks Andy to the prom, whereupon they kiss. Andy visits Iona at her Chinatown apartment and gives her the details of her date and mentions her prom invitation. This inspires Iona to get dressed up in her own prom dress. She dances with Andy to Cherish by the Association while reminiscing about her teen years. Andy tries to shop for a prom dress, but the clerk is snotty to her and everything's too expensive, and she keeps running into her mean classmates. Steph applies pressure on Blaine to dump Andy, letting him know he'll lose all his friends if he continues to see her. This strategy works on Blaine, who is cute yet spineless, and he starts dodging Andy's calls. Andy's father buys her a discount prom dress. Andy realizes her father has been lying to her about finding a new job, and they get into a shouting match over his inability to realize his wife is never going to return to them. Andy confronts Blaine and forces him to admit he's been dodging her. When she asks him about prom, he lies and claims he forgot he'd already asked another girl. Steph gloats to Blaine that he knew all along that Andy was trash. Ducky overhears this. Irate, Ducky attacks Steph and does an astonishingly good job of kicking the crap out of him. Andy stops by Iona's place where she's greeted by Iona's new straight-laced boyfriend, Terrence. A love-struck Iona has ditched her punk clothes and her crazy hair and has given herself a yuppie makeover to fit in better with Terrence's world, because true love means dressing like a real estate agent to impress some guy. A distraught Andy asks if she can have Iona's prom dress. She doesn't mention to Iona that she just wants it for the fabric, and watching this as a kid, it horrified me when, in the very next scene, Andy chops it to pieces. I suppose it's fair to assume that Andy and Iona are close enough that Iona gave it with the full knowledge that Andy, as a designer, would transform it into something different. Andy takes Iona's dress and the dress her father bought her and melds them together Voltron style to create a totally new dress. She shows off her creation to her father. The completed dress is not great, but it 
doesn't have to be. Andy created it herself, it's original, and it reflects her style better than either of the two dresses she sacrificed in its creation. She tells her dad she's going to go to prom by herself to show the rich kids they didn't break her spirit. As If You Leave by Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark plays, Andy arrives at the prom. Steph is there with Benny, and Blaine is there on his own. Andy hesitates before entering, but Ducky shows up, spiffed out in a suit and bolo tie, and escorts her inside. That's where the film ended originally, and audiences at test screenings absolutely hated it. According to accounts from the filmmakers, it was greeted with a chorus of boos. So they slapped a wig on poor Andrew McCarthy, who had already cut his hair for a new role, and they filmed a more crowd-pleasing ending. Blaine walks up to Ducky and Andy, pausing only to tell off Steph. He shakes hands with Ducky and tells Andy that he loves her, then leaves the prom. Ducky tells Andy he can't stand in the way of her happy ending, and urges her to go after Blaine. Alone on the dance floor, Ducky spots a cute blonde girl, played by Christy Swanson, the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer, beckoning to him. Ducky looks straight at the camera, as if to acknowledge that this is a totally ridiculous plot twist, and heads after her. In the parking lot, Andy and Blaine kiss. 35 years later, audiences are still polarized as to whether Andy should have ended up with Blaine or with Ducky. Here are my thoughts on the matter. If we interpret the original ending to mean that Andy and Ducky are now girlfriend and boyfriend, that's unsatisfying. Because we've seen throughout the film that Andy does not regard Ducky romantically, and this film is about Andy, not about Ducky's attempts to win her heart. If we interpret that ending in the way I believe it was intended, Ducky is helping his best friend execute a flawless kiss-off to the rich, mean losers that populate their school, yeah, I think that's a pretty good and satisfying way to end the film. But I don't hate the theatrical ending. Yes, Blaine is morally weak, but he knows that, and he's ashamed of it, and he finally shows some backbone at the prom by telling off Steph and admitting to Andy that he doesn't deserve her. He's probably not worthy of Andy, but she likes him, they enjoy each other's company, and it's not a bad thing that they end up together. Also, that ending gives Ducky an added level of redemption after his horrible and childish treatment of Andy earlier. It shows that he's now mature enough to encourage Andy to pursue her own happiness, even though it breaks his heart. As in Sixteen Candles in the Breakfast Club, we see Hughes's gift for creating teen characters who speak and act like genuine teens. In Steph, and to a lesser extent Benny and her mean friends, the film has some pretty good villains who are cruel and awful, and yet who don't seem like cartoons. I go back and forth on Ducky, because in many ways this is a character who has not aged well, and who is given more sympathy by the script than he probably deserves. And yet, we understand Ducky. He's sometimes charming and lovable, and he's sometimes an immature creep. While that makes Ducky a highly problematic friend to Andy, it also makes him a realistic teenager. The set design and the wardrobe do a nice job of establishing these characters. For instance, we see a very quick scene of Ducky's bedroom, with his mattress on the floor and graffiti scribbled on the wall, and it seems exactly right for him. Ducky is doing what he can with limited means to express his offbeat personality through his decor. I like the way Andy and Ducky dress. I like the record store. I like Iona's quirky and chaotic apartment contrasted with Steph's tasteful and well-appointed mansion. Pretty in Pink features a pretty basic story about the rocky path of teen romance, but it's elevated by good performances, a great soundtrack, and some nice details. Next time I'm looking at Richard Donner's medieval fantasy Ladyhawk, which starred Rutger Hauer, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Matthew Broderick. Thank you very much for joining me here today, and hopefully I'll see you then.